Shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God and it is he who made us. And we are his, we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Well, welcome to the services today at Benjamin Christian Church. We're glad you're here. And uh, from the scriptures from 1 Timothy chapter 2, I found a couple of verses that I thought would be good for us today. Where the Apostle Paul says, For there is one God... And there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. Right after Easter, it's shortly after Easter, and uh, we still realize that uh, our salvation comes from Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the one who lived a perfect life and who died for us, was buried and resurrected on the third day, and now lives forever at the right hand of Christ. God. So uh, it's good for us to be in God's house today. As we begin, we're going to open with a word of prayer in just a moment. But uh, before I do, uh, let me just uh, update our prayer list a little bit. Uh, there are some of these papers laying around on the tables that you can pick up and, and remember in prayer. But there are uh, several on there, but there are three that I want to mention in particular. Uh, Lannis Tedrow, and uh, Lannis is here today. Lannis' uh, grandson's mom, Bethany, has been diagnosed with advanced colon cancer. And we need to be in prayer for that family, for this disease and terrible, terrible things. Keep the whole family in our prayers. Also, I want to mention uh, that uh, Ted Brumlevy is not here this morning. Ted had a little episode yesterday, high blood pressure. Uh, maybe a little heat exhaustion, don't know, but he is uh, home and uh, recouping, and so uh, we'll, we'll want to be in prayer for, for Ted. And then uh, I, would, I would mention Margaret. Uh, Margaret uh, has been in Brazil for some activities, and she's on her way home, maybe back in the States by now already, but Margaret had an episode while she was in Brazil, had to have some surgery, and uh, so she needs to be, we need to be praying for her, uh, for her safety, if she's not home, that she returns home safely, for her health, that she gains strength over this surgery, and I don't know more than that what the surgery was, but uh, we do pray for Margaret, and we pray for all of our needs. Certainly, many of us have prayer needs, and situations in our health and in our bodies. So let me lead us in a word of prayer, and then we'll get into our worship this morning. Let's pray together. Thank you, Father, for blessing us through Jesus Christ. Father, we lift up to you everyone who is here, and some who have some serious health problems, and uh, some who are recovering from serious health problems. Father, we just ask that you would lift us all up, bless us physically, and emotionally and spiritually that we'll be serving you. Father, we do want to mention especially uh, Lannis' uh, grandson's mother, Bethany, that she might be able to uh, recoup uh, and be able to be back in a strong form of health. We do pray for uh, Ted and that he can gain his health back quickly and be out and about. And for Margaret, and her leadership here at the church, we love her and appreciate her ministry so much. But Father, uh, be with her that she can heal quickly, that she gains strength, and that she's back out about very soon. And so many others on our prayer list, Father, friends and her relatives and loved ones, some suffering from cancer, some with other uh, situations going on in their lives. Father, look into our hearts, look into these uh, people 
and uh, just bless, Father, as only you can. Now be with us this morning that it will be a great worship service as we praise your name. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. 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 Let me share a scripture with you and then some thoughts from Mark 14, looking at verses 22 and following. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them and said, Take, this is my body. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave to them and they all drank of it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. I imagine you've heard the following song, which is almost 50 years old. Not a church song, but a catchy song. It's entitled, We, and that doesn't probably ring a bell, but it was written by a guy by the name of Freddie Mercury, you may have heard of him, and originally performed by his group called Queen. That has nothing to do with the church, but listen to the lyrics. <laughs> the lyrics of that song say, I paid my dues time after time. I've done my sentence, but committed no crime. And bad mistakes, I've made a few. I've had my share of sand kicked in my face, but I've come through. We are the champions, my friends, and we'll keep on fighting till the end. We are the champions. We are the champions. No time for losers, because we are the champions of the world. Now, whatever comes to your mind from the song, listen to how that can be applied in the church and at this time. With very little editing, this should be the theme of the Christians as we gather to partake of the Lord's Supper this morning. Actually, Jesus paid our dues on Calvary once and for all. He committed no crime. In fact, he lived a perfect life. He made no mistakes at all. Though he was mistreated, betrayed, denied, doubted, lied about, spat upon, slapped, beaten, whipped, disowned by those closest to him, and crucified. But he came through, resurrecting from death and the grave on the first day of the week to live forevermore. He is our champion, but for we who are Christians, he makes us champions too. Maybe we aren't the champions of the world, but we are champions in Christ. And because of Jesus and our faith in him, we live forevermore in eternity with him. So the next time you hear those lyrics and you think about that tune, remember that we're champions in Christ. And we gather here this morning to celebrate Christ and his victory over death and the grave. And right now we do that by observing the Lord's Supper. Let me pray and then we'll partake of the bread and the juice. Thank you, Father, for salvation through Jesus Christ. Thank you that he died a perfect man, a holy man, a, a, an unjust crucifixion and death. But he died so that we might live. And he resurrected from the day from the grave, Father, showing his victory over death. Now, may we remember him, his broken body, represented by this bread, his spilled blood, represented by the juice. Bless us, Father, as we partake and remember. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> How y'all doing? Yeah. Anyway. Oh wow. He he doesn't need a mic, does he? Uh, hopefully, uh, not a not any of you are dealing with allergies like I am. Uh, so my eyes have been itchy all week and been sneezing. Hopefully, uh, I don't go into a sneezing fit here today. But uh, if I do, just you know, 
Uh, give me some grace. Uh, anyway, it's good to be here. Good to see everyone here this morning. Uh, let's go to God in prayer. God, thank you so much for today, and uh, thank you so much for each and every person here. Thank you so much for um, the, this church and these people that, that we can come together as a church family and, and praise your name together, uh, because you have sent your Son to die for all of us. Uh, you you are, are our God, and, and we are your people. And we thank you so much for your love and your grace and your provision in our life. And uh, God, I just thank you so much for um, uh, what we have in common. Uh, I pray that you would strengthen us and, and help us to not let our differences divide us, but to be unified. Because you've given us a mission uh, to take your love and the message of grace and hope uh, to, to people who don't know you. And I pray that that mission uh, would, would, would be more important to us than the things that divide us. It's your name I pray. Amen. This right here uh, is a pencil. It costs 16 cents. Very, you know, cheap. Um, people have been writing with utensils like this dating back to ancient Sumerians. Uh, but this iteration of a writing instrument... Uh, was invented in, in 1795 by Nicholas Jacques Conti. He was the first person to mix graphite powder uh, with clay and, and encase it into a wooden cylinder, uh, which gave rise to this beautiful piece of ingenuity. Uh, this simple little device has been used by billions of people to create art, to write down their thoughts, to... Uh, create stories and countless other works of human innovation. Uh, possibly the simplest thing ever created, and yet one of the most complex. In, in the December 1958 issue of the Freeman Magazine, uh, Leonard Reed wrote an article called I Pencil, uh, where he spoke from the point of view of a pencil. Uh, to explain just how incredibly complex this simple item really is. Uh, he pointed out in the article uh, that there isn't a single person on the planet who knows how to completely make one of these because of the countless number of hands that are, are required to create it. Uh, let me read you a portion of that essay. Uh, my family tree, meaning the, the, the pencil's family tree, begins what, with what is in fact a tree, a cedar of straight grain that grows in Northern California and Oregon. And now contemplate all the saws and trucks and rope and countless other gear used in harvesting and carting the cedar logs to the railroad siding. Think of all the persons and the numberless skills that, that, were, uh, that went into their fabrication. The mining of the ore, the making of steel and its refinement into saws, axes, motors. The growing of hemp and bringing it through all the stages to heavy and strong rope. The logging camps with their beds and mess halls. Uh, the cookery and, and the raising of all the foods. Why untold thousands of persons had a hand in every cup of coffee the loggers drink. The logs are shipped to a mill in San Leandro, California. Can you imagine the individuals who make flat cars and, and rails and railroad engines and who construct and install the communication systems incidental there too? These lesions are among my antecedents. Consider the millwork in San Leandro. Uh, the cedar logs are cut into small pencil length, length slats, less than uh, one fourth of an inch in thickness. The slats are waxed and kiln dried. Uh, how many skills went into the making of the tent and, and the kilns, into supplying the heat, the light, and the power, the belts, motors, and all the other things a mill requires? Included are the men who poured the concrete for the dam of a Pacific gas and electric hydro plant, which supplies the mill's power. My lead contains no lead at all. It's complex. 
Uh, the graphite is mined in Ceylon, Sri Lanka. Consider these miners and those who make their many tools and the makers of the paper sacks in which the graphite is shipped and those who make the string that ties up the sacks and those who put them aboard ships and, and those who make the ships, e even the lighthouse keepers along the way assisted in my birth, as well as the harbor pilots. Uh, the graphite is mixed with uh, clay from Mississippi in which ammonium hydroxide is used in the refining process. Uh, then wetting agents are added such as sulfonated tallow, animal fats chemically reacted uh, with sulfuric acid. After passing through numerous machines, uh, the mixture finally appears as endless extrusions. Cut to size, dried, and baked for several hours at 1850 degrees Fahrenheit. To increase their strength and smoothness, the leads are then treated with a hot mixture. That, that includes candelilla wax from Mexico, uh, paraffin wax, and hydrogenated and, uh, natural fats. Uh, my cedar receives six coats of lacquer. Do you know all the ingredients of lacquer? Uh, who, would have, who, would have, who would think that the, the growers of castor beans and, and the refiners of castor oil are a part of it? They are. Uh, why, even the processes by which lacquer is made a beautiful yellow involve the skills of more persons than one can enumerate. Uh, observe the labeling. Uh, that's a film formed by applying heat to carbon black mixed with resins. Uh, my bit of metal, the ferrule, is brass. Uh, think, think of all the persons who, who mine zinc and, and copper and those who have the skills to make shiny sheets of brass from the products of nature. Uh, then there's my crowning glory. Inelegantly referred to in the trade as the plug. Uh, the part that man uses to erase his mistakes. Uh, an ingredient called factice is what does the erasing. It's a rubber-like product made by reacting rapeseed oil from the Dutch East Indies with sulfur chloride. Rubber, contrary to common notion, is only used for binding purposes. Then, too, are numerous vulcanizing and accelerating agents. Uh, the pumice comes from Italy, and the pigment that gives the plug its color is cadmium sulfide. Reed's article, I Pencil, explain the immense complexity of the modern economy. The millions upon millions of hands all over the globe that go into producing even the simplest device. If millions of human beings with a million different skills, million different abilities are needed to create a simple pencil, how much more is every single person with a great variety of skills needed to build the kingdom of God? Now, this is the second week of this sermon series called We Are One, where we are focusing our attention as a church onto one of the hallmarks that we're highlighting as utmost importance this year, unity. Now, last week, we, we talked about the importance that Jesus placed upon unity among his followers. It was so important to Jesus that his followers be unified that it was the last thing he prayed for before he went to the cross. He prayed for his disciples to be unified. But over the last 2,000 years, we haven't done a very good job at doing that. Evidenced by the over 10,000 denominations here, just here in the United States. Churches have divided over the silliest things, the most inconsequential things. But here at Linden Christian Church, we are going to be united. No longer will we be divided over personality conflicts or differences of opinion. 
we're going to lay down our petty disagreements and come together behind our commonalities. Now, last week, we're, 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 we talked about what all Christians have in common. We all come from the same place. We're all sinners in need of a Savior. We, we are all going in the same direction. We're all imperfect, and, and the Holy Spirit is, is moving us in the direction of being perfected. And, and we all have the same destination. We're all going to end up in the same place. Heaven, our eternal home. And so, let us be united. Because Jesus left us with a job to do. That's more important than anything uh, that, 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 that might divide us. And that job is to take the gospel to all nations to make disciples. Uh, I read this week about uh, Tomoka Christian Church in, in Ormond Beach, Florida. In 1996, uh, they read the words of the Great Commission, the, 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 the job that Jesus left his disciples to do. They, they read those words to go into all nations, and they decided to take that literally. And over the last 30 years, they have helped to plant a church in every single country around the world. They give, a mil they give $4 million a year to mission partners. How awesome would that be? That if we here at Linden Christian Church decided to take the Great Commission as seriously as they did. Uh, imagine what kind of impact that we could have 30 years from now. Uh, my, my prayer for this church is that when my grandkids are running around here coloring on the walls, that Linden Christian Church would have the same kind of impact that that church did. That we would be doing the same thing all over the world. But it has to start with unity. We cannot make an impact out there if we are not unified in here. And there is one thing that keeps the church going generation after generation. I was looking at Tomoka's website, that church's website this week. And, uh, and part of their mission as a church was to make it harder for the next generation to go to hell. I like that. To make it harder for the next generation to go to hell. That's what I want for this church. That this church would make it harder for the next generation of kids here in Linden, make it harder for them to go to hell. And there is only one thing that's going to make that happen. But the problem is that that same thing that, that can make that happen can also be the thing that keeps it from happening. That there is a secret ingredient that, that the church has, a secret weapon that the church has that continues the church generation after generation. But it can also be the thing that leads to the church's cessation. The, the same thing that causes the church to continue is the same thing that can make a church close its doors. It's like a lot of things. A gun can be used for good, to stop a crime, to, to hunt something for dinner. Or it can be used for evil. Money can be used to do a lot of good in the world. It can also be used for evil. This one thing can make a church grow and grow and grow, leading to more and more people to become disciples. Or... It can cause a church to split and divide and eventually close. That one thing is diversity. Differences among people. We can allow our differences to divide us and eventually the church, this church will no longer be around. Or it can be the thing that spurs this church to fulfill the Great Commission and make a huge impact 30 years down the road and beyond. 
Our diversity is our strength because it takes lots of different people to reach lots of different people. It takes lots of different gifts to build the kingdom of God. And God has designed each and every one of you with the exact gifts you need to do the works that He has planned in advance for you to do. Ephesians 2.10 says this, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We are God's workmanship. Uh, that, that word in the Greek referred to uh, something made by a master craftsman. What, what you might call an artist's masterpiece. We are God's masterpiece. He has carefully crafted you into exactly who you are. Because He has prepared good works for you to do. He has prepared kingdom work that only you can do. He has made you unique so that you can do them. And you know I'm a preacher, so I have to create an acronym. Uh, God has created you unique. He, God has given you all these things that have created you to be you. All these things that have created you into a one-of-a-kind masterpiece. He's given you utensils, things that you own, things that you have at your disposal, resources. Any sort of physical, material thing, item that you own, that you have at your disposal, can be used for kingdom work. Uh, your money, your house, your car, items uh, in your house that you might donate to someone that doesn't have them. Uh, you might use your lawnmower to cut someone's grass who isn't able to do it. Well, whatever it may be, God has given you utensils, all kinds of stuff that you can use to serve Him. He's placed you in your own niche. At Acts 17, 26, Paul said that God has determined allotted periods and boundaries of every single person, uh, person's dwelling place. God has placed you exactly where you are. In this point in human history, in this community, in your exact neighborhood, where you live, with your neighbors, with your friendships, with your relationships, God has placed you in that spot. Because that is your niche. Where He has placed you because that's where He wants you to be. That's where He wants you to serve. He's given you your identity. Who you are on the inside. Your likes, your dislikes, your preferences, the, the, the way that you're bent. That might be your Myers-Briggs assessment. Uh, whether you're an introvert or an extrovert, uh, whether you're, you typically are thinking or t typically feeling, wh whether you are sensing or intuitive, whether you're judging or perceiving, all the different personality categories that, that people fall into based on the identity that God has created them to be. All, all those things about your identity make you unique as a person. But, not, but, but so does your personality quirks. It isn't just about what personality category that you fall into. There are things about your personality that makes you different than even other people with that same type of personality. You might have the exact same personality type as someone else, but there are quirks to your personality that make you different. Uh, you have also developed useful skills throughout your life that you can serve God. You've accumulated life experiences that shape you into who you are. You are unique. And, and God has made you exactly who you are through all of these different things because He has a uni unique purpose for your life. He has prepared in advance good works for you to do that only you can do. 
as many people as there are in his kingdom is how many different roles for them he has in his kingdom. There is a one-to-one ratio between kingdom people and kingdom jobs. Our, Our one unique work for every unique person. And that's exactly what David said at Ephesians, or or Paul said, I'm sorry, at Ephesians chapter 4. Last week, uh, we looked at verses 1 through 6 uh, of Ephesians chapter 4. And so we'll start uh, in verse 7 this morning as we work our way through this chapter, through this series. Uh, But real quick, to to finish up, I want to run through this passage, Ephesians 4, 7 through 12. And I could talk another uh, 45 minutes about this, but uh, I'll try to keep it within the time we have left here. Um, But Ephesians chapter 4, uh, verses 7 through 12, you can follow along in your own Bible or the Bible's provided for you. Uh, But the the words will be on the screen as well. Uh, So let's read that together. Ephesians 4, starting in verse 7. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean? But that he also descended into the lower regions, the earth. He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of Christ, or the building up the body of Christ. Grace was given to each of us. Now, Now, this isn't talking about grace in terms of salvation. Uh, The word here is the Greek word charis, which is where we get our English word charity. And it it simply means gift. It can refer to the gift of salvation. which a lot of times we uh, connotate that word grace with the gift of salvation. But it can also refer to just a, a gift in general. And that's how that word is used here. Grace was given to each of us, meaning gifts were given to each of us. Gifts in terms of your unique capacity to serve in the church, his kingdom. This is actually a play on words that Paul used here. That God gave you gifts in accordance to the gift that you received, the Holy Spirit. The, 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 the gift that Christ gave. Christ gave his followers the Holy Spirit. And that gift determines the gifts God the Father gives to you. In verses 1 through 6 uh, that we talked about last week, uh, Paul talked about how and why we need to preserve unity. And then here in verse 7, he showed why that's so difficult. Because we're all different. We all have different gifts. We've all been given different things. Our differences have the potential to divide us. But those gifts were given to us by God. And He's given them to us for a purpose. And that purpose is unity. And that purpose is fulfilling the job that He has given us. To build up the body of Christ. Uh, he, he cited Psalm 68, 18 uh, to kind of back up what he was saying. Uh, this is what he, his quote. When he ascended on high... He led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. Uh, Some scholars have made the case uh, that this psalm from which Paul uh, is is quoting, Psalm 68, was a special song that the ancient Israelites used in a special worship service. That that every so often the, the, the people of Israel would come together for a special worship service uh, kind of like what we had a few weeks ago, a night of worship. And they would sing this psalm, Psalm 68. Because it is a song that details the timeline of events in Israel's history. Where God showed up in big and mighty ways. All the great and powerful works that God did for His people. This is the song is about how when God shows up, He makes Himself known. 
He, he does big, audacious, conspicuous things. A lot, a lot of times people ask the question, why is God so mysterious? Why doesn't he reveal himself? He does. He shows up in big, audacious, conspicuous ways. And this is what the psalm is about. This is, this is what the, the psalm says about God. He, he scatters his enemies. He protects the fatherless and the widows. He, he houses the homeless. He, he lifts up the righteous in their oppression and brings low the wicked who oppress them. He comes with thunder and lightning. His presence is felt with earthquakes and with fire. God is so big and so great, conventional wisdom would tell you that he should make his dwelling place on the highest, mightiest mountain in all the land. In Israel, that mountain was Mount, Mount Bashan. It was the tallest, it still is, the tallest mountain in all of Israel. But no, he made his dwelling place on little old Mount Zion, which is nothing more than a hill. Thousands of feet shorter than Mount Bashan, where Jerusalem sits. He should be the God of the mightiest people in the world, your Assyrians or your Babylonians, but no, he chose the little nation of Israel as his people. He shows how great, how mighty he is by choosing the lowliest people and equipping them to do great and mighty things. That's what Psalm 68 is about. And there in verse 18, the psalmist spoke of God ascending up to Mount Zion to his official dwelling place to be among his people in Jerusalem. At the place where the temple would be built. And that, that scene where God ascends up Mount Zion actually happened. It happened in, in 2 Samuel chapter 6. When David had the Ark of the Covenant, which was the symbol of God's presence, brought up the mountain to the city of Jerusalem. The Ark being carried up the mountain represented God ascending on high. And behind him led a train of captives, a host of slaves, the Israelite people who were slaves in Egypt. And, and when, he, when he arrived at the top of the mountain with the Ark of the Covenant, David offered God a sacrifice to commemorate the event. Uh, the, the Aramaic paraphrase of the Jewish scriptures is called the Targum. It's, it's kind of like the message version of our English Bible. Uh, but in the Targum, uh, the, the, the Targum is the source that Paul used for this quote. He, he, he quoted the paraphrase because he, he was trying to make a point, a specific point. In, in the Targum, uh, this passage, it parallels this event, the Ark God's presence ascending up Mount Zion. It parallels, parallels that event uh, with Moses on Mount Sinai. Where God descended. God ascended with the Ark of the Covenant. But God descended onto Mount Sinai where he met Moses. And there on that mountain, he gave the people of Israel a gift. The law. He gave the law to man. Uh, Paul used this parallel to make his argument. Uh, th th this, is, this is what he's saying in this quotation that he used from the Targum. There, there's, a, a, there's a gift exchange between God and his people. Th there's two parts to Paul's argument. There's a portion about descending and there's a portion about ascending. He used this parallel example of God ascending on Mount, Zionai, or Mount Zion and descending on Mount Sinai to make his point. Now, this is kind of how his argument goes. God descended onto Mount Sinai. And he gave a gift to man, which was the law. Man gives a gift in return to God. By obeying the law. 
God descended to the earth in the man Jesus Christ to give a gift to man, salvation, through his death on the cross. His death on the cross, this gift, was the fulfillment of the law because Jesus took on the penalty of the law. Uh, Our gift to God in return for this gift of salvation is to do good works that he has prepared for us beforehand to do. And then God sends us his Holy Spirit, which descends upon us in our baptism. This Holy Spirit is a gift given to us. This gift gives us spiritual gifts for us to use to serve. And our gift in return for receiving these gifts is to use those gifts sacrificially when we serve others. That, that's the descending part of, of a summer, the descending part of the summary of, of, of Paul's argument. Uh, but God the Father, or the, God the Father descended on Mount Sinai. Jesus the Son descended to go to the cross, and the Holy Spirit descended upon us in our baptism. But there's also an, the ascending part of the argument. Uh, God ascended up Mount Zion in the Ark of the Covenant. And his gift to his people was his presence with them in the temple. Jesus ascended to heaven after his resurrection. And his gift was what he said at Matthew 28, 20. That he would be with us always, even to the very end of the age. And his presence remains with us with this gift of the Holy Spirit that indwells within every believer. His presence is always with us. Because his Holy Spirit dwells within us. Now, I know that's a lot to digest. But, but, but the point is that, that he is describing this gift exchange between God and man. God has given us gifts to use to give gifts back to God and to other people in the form of doing good works. And then he continued that not only has he given every single one of us gifts, he's given the church as a whole gifts in the form of leaders. He's given five types of leaders. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. These are official offices in the church. These are leaders. Uh, Two of them were reserved for the uh, first century to do the initial building, to lay the groundwork, the foundation. And once the New Testament was completed, their work was done. And leadership of the church was handed over to evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. Uh, Shepherds, which are elders and teachers. Uh, And teachers are a subset of elders. I'll explain that in a second. But, But apostles were those who were appointed to the office of apostle. Uh, One of the requirements to be considered for this office was to have uh, been with Jesus from the beginning of his ministry. If you weren't with Jesus from the beginning of his ministry, you aren't qualified to be an apostle. Prophets are are those gifted in the first century with the gift of prophecy. Uh, Prophecy isn't a prediction of the future like we we tend to think. Uh, Prophecy is just a message from God. Sometimes it contains a prediction in the future. But all prophecy is is a message from God. And so if God audibly talks to you and he gives you a message to share with other people, then you are a prophet because he's given you a prophecy. Uh, But but now that we have the, the New Testament... Well, we have the full message from God about Jesus. We no longer need any more messages because we have the message. We can read it for ourselves. And so there are no longer prophets. But there are evangelists. An evangelist is just someone who shares the gospel with someone else, with, with a non-Christian. Today, we typically call these people missionaries. Uh, They're they're sent out and they they go share the gospel with non-Christians. Shepherds are also called pastors. They're elders of a local church. They're also sometimes called overseers or bishops or presbyters. Uh, All these different names are synonymous. They talk about the same office. The office of elder. And elders are the spiritual leaders of a local congregation. And one of the requirements 
to be an elder, to be considered for the office of elder, is you have the ability to teach. It isn't required that an elder teach, but he should be able to teach when needed. And so a subset of, of elder is a teacher. In 1 Timothy, Paul, Paul says that each congregation should have an elder who dedicates himself to the preaching and teaching of the Word. That's what we today call the minister or the, the preacher. This is, this is the position that I hold here at LCC. And so Paul said that these leaders have been given to the church as a gift for a purpose. And that purpose is to equip the saints for ministry. Now, a lot of times we, we look at people on staff at a church and we say, oh, they're the ministers. They're the ones that need to be doing the ministry. That's not what Paul says here. Paul said that the leaders of the church, the elders and the staff, are to equip the saints for ministry. Now, the saints are, are all the other believers in the church, all the other Christians. If you're a believer in Jesus, you're a saint. The leaders are to give the saints resources. The, the, the leaders are to equip the saints through training to go out and do ministry. The leaders equip the rest of the people go and do ministry. And so if, if you are um, a leader, if you're an elder here at Linden Christian Church, you need to be equipping people for ministry. If you are everyone else, you need to be doing ministry. That's the good works that God has prepared in advance for you to do. That is your ministry. And God has given you these gifts to do them. And He wants you to do them so that you will build up the body of Christ. God's kingdom. Diversity can either kill a church or help it grow exponentially. We've all been given different gifts. And we can fight each other and bicker and argue and grumble with each other and be divided. Or we can come together and work together in all the different ways that we have abilities and gifts to work to reach all kinds of different people. We're all unique. And we've all been tasked with a unique ministry. The ministry, the, the good works that God has called you to do cannot be done by anyone else. Because He has uniquely created you to do them. So if you're not serving in a ministry, come talk to me, come talk to one of the elders, and we will get you equipped to do it. We'll make sure you're given everything you need to do the good works that God has prepared for you to do. God has gifted you to serve in a way that only you can do. And God has created, uniquely created you to build up His kingdom in a way that only you can do. That only you can build it up. So let's not let our differences divide us. Let's come together in all our different gifts to get the job done. Build up the body of Christ and reach all kinds of different people. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for this, this teaching. God, I pray that it, it would convict our hearts, that, that, that we would get to work doing what you have uniquely created us to do. Not, not a other single person has the same experiences we have, the same combination of uh, skills and personality and, and opportunities that you have given each one of us. You've created each one of us unique. And placed us all in a unique place in order to reach the people that you want us to reach. To build up your kingdom. To make disciples. To teach them everything that you commanded. God, I pray that you would help this church to get about the job of carrying out the mission. Help us to be the reason that it's hard for the next generation in this community to go to hell. God, I pray that the ministry that happens here at this church would lead lots and lots of people to the hope and the love that they have in your son. 
Thank you so much for grace, for the gift of salvation, for hope of eternal life. To your name I pray. Amen.